everybody, Alex here, and welcome to another pod video cast thing. So, as it stands, I am once again recording in the dinette area. Um, I think there's going to be a little bit of an echo because this is a smaller room, and I am by a wall. But um, I'll try to edit this the best I can to at least mitigate any form of echo, if any. So, Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, I played it. I finished it. I absolutely loved it. And um, it's a little bit of a different game. Uh, there will be some spoilers, potentially. If you've played Final Fantasy VII, I mean, on, speaking for myself, you have nothing to worry about. Um, it is different, however. Um, but you'll have to play it to find out what is different. But I do kind of like the way Square uh, went about it. Now again, let us begin. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. If you haven't played it, you're interested in playing it, you're currently playing through the original, step off now. Because the beauty of this remake is that it does a lot of familiar and it does a lot of the old, but it spices it up and it makes it new. And to understand why, I guess, this game was so impactful for me, I have to tell you about my history with Final Fantasy VII. And Final Fantasy VII is not my favorite Final Fantasy. I, actually, I don't hold it on that pedestal at all that a lot of people have it on as one of the greatest RPGs of all time. It was great. It was fun. I think it really opened up the genre to a Western audience. It was the first time, really, we had seen an RPG that had that 3D polygon, I guess you could almost say, I don't want to say Western aesthetic, but that Western draw, because really that's where the PlayStation thrived, was unlike the Saturn, you know, it was able to do 3D graphics, and ultimately, apparently, that's what Americans wanted. And uh, a game like this really proved that. Although I honestly love 2D, I think, more these days because sprites can be even more expressive, I think. But with Final Fantasy VII, as I recall, being a kid, you know, I had a modded PlayStation 1. And I used to go to this store called Games and James, or James and Games. If you guys lived in New York in like the 90s, you probably remember this place was right off of Times Square. And they sold imports, they sold bootleg anime, and they sold burnt games, and they modded systems. So I had a modded PS1, and I bought a demo disc off of them a burned one from some Japanese magazine it had Final Fantasy 7 on it and I think it had Metal Gear on it or it was a second one they had that had Metal Gear on it it was like five bucks or ten bucks or something and that demo was incredible you know you were able to see the opening part uh, at the um, at Shinra not Shinra at the Mako factory and you got to experience a summon being Leviathan, and you got to see these ridiculous graphics and some cinematics in action, and they'd never been done before. And then the beauty of the whole thing was, because on Western soil, localization and day and day worldwide releases weren't really a thing yet, so you gotta wait for like three fucking years until the damn thing came out, staring at blurry-ass pictures in Game Fan from the first 10 minutes of the game and just awe at them. And then a game like, I think it was Tobal number one comes out and most people only bought it for the demo. <laughs> Cause Tobal number one, I mean, I love Akira Toriyama. I thought it was an okay fighting game. It is not one of the best games ever. But Final Fantasy VII was really cool because at that point in my life, I had never pre-ordered anything. Final Fantasy VII is actually the first game I pre-ordered. And um, I remember I went to, I think it was Software Etc. still at the time. I went there with my mom, and I pre-ordered Final Fantasy VII. I had to put five dollars down, and back then it really, it wasn't. It was a little bit more archaic. They're like, you can give us your pager number or something like that, and it was like, or you could just bring in the receipt. And to pick up the game with the receipt was like the funniest thing because I had it posted on this bulletin board we had in our kitchen, and it was up there for so long. It must have crossed over a couple of Christmases or something because the heat and everything in that kitchen from when my mom was cooking and whatnot caused the ink to almost evaporate from this receipt to the point where I was worried that I wouldn't even be able to pick up the damn game because I couldn't read it. 
and the game came out like the second day of school when I was in like seventh or eighth grade. Second day, and I remember we, um, my school, the first week, they always did half days. So you would start on Monday and there would be a half day through Friday. And uh, drove the parents crazy because, you know, they still had to figure out how to pick up their damn kids. But luckily, by my, where I was at my age, I was able to take my own dumbass home. And I was counting the minutes for this game to come out. And then I ran to the train. And here's, a, here's stupid Alex. Alex gets really excited and nervous about things a lot. Um, he tends to overthink things and plan it out to the point where it drives him nuts. So the software, et cetera, I had pre-ordered this game out. It was, no, it, was, it was near my house, but it wasn't accessible via the train. So I had sat down <laughs> and calculated out using simple mathematics, which train station would be the most optimal for me to get off at so I could get the game the quickest and head home. So I got off at 23rd Street. So from my school it was on 86th Street. So I had to take what I did was I took the express to 42nd, then I changed to the local, and then I took the local to 23rd. Then I walked down, picked up the game, and then I ran home, pretty much. But, you know, I actually skipped out on something. Part of the perk for pre-ordering Final Fantasy VII back in the day was you got this sweet t-shirt. And I wish I still had this shirt. It was white, and um, I was a... Uh, husky kid and um i had a, a slight sweating problem from the puberty so white t-shirts and i did not mix which is why i love the illusion of guy t-shirt so much i oh, wish i had that again but anyway so this t-shirt i think it's worth a ton of money now and i i may have mentioned this before in one of the older videos back when i had them up but so cool and it was <laughs> it was cloud strife on the back it had the logo on the um one of the uh, chest pieces, I guess, whatever the hell you want to call it. The, yeah, chest, I guess. Um, and it had his stats and his blood type. You know, there was like no context to any of it. But at the time, it's like, if somebody was wearing that shirt, you're like, oh, they pre-ordered Final Fantasy VII. And now years later, it's like, oh, that guy plays video games. And as a matter of fact, anecdotally, um, I was out with my girlfriend the other day. And I was wearing my uh, a Foxhound t-shirt I had. And some guy actually was like, oh, I love Metal Gear. And I turned around like, oh, God, is this somebody that recognizes me from YouTube from like a thousand years ago? And uh, no, it was just somebody who in his quarantine had gone crazy and decided to order Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation 1. I told him it's just as good, which it is. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of that. Again, going back to playing games in quarantine and this whole pandemic thing but anyway so i um <laughs> i ran to pick up this game with my receipt which was barely legible at this point paid off the difference and the guy upsold me on the strategy guide and to say i didn't read the strategy guide would be an absolute lie because i went page by page with that damn thing um i pretty much other than killing the ruby weapon did everything in this game and the only reason why I didn't kill the ruby weapon is because at that point I just lost interest. But I did everything. I got knights. I got all the chocobos. I won all the races. I got a lifetime pass to the gold saucer. I actually stopped at that point in the game and grinded specifically so I could get the lifetime pass the second I went into the golden saucer. So I literally stopped my process for like three days, four days, something like that. Just grinding on bullshit mobs. And to that point, I had so much gill. And... Um, I wasn't over leveled because obviously the monsters don't scale with you, but I was very well prepared for the rest of the game at that point. But I loved it. I really enjoyed this game. It was it was cool because it was different. You know, Final Fantasy IV is my favorite, and this was more of a steampunk thing. You know, going through Midgard, you know, you got to see what felt like an eternity going through that first section, and it's really not that long at all. But it had so much character. You know, you had, you know, the Honey Bee In sequences. You had, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the Mako reactor. You had the whole thing with Avalanche. You had the bar, Seventh Head. You had all these great s set pieces in pre-rendered backgrounds. And they all had personality and character. 
And then once the game opens up and you get to go into what I like to call the traditional RPG part, you know, the world crawling and everything else, you still see character. There's a beautiful scene in Final Fantasy VII. I can't remember the exact area, but it's where you find the material for Alexander. No pun intended. But you would literally never notice it because it's literally just a little sparkling thing in the corner of the screen. And it's in some lush green area. And even when you meet Aerith uh, the first time in the cathedral, not the first time, you already met her at that point. But once you meet her in the cathedral, you see that beautiful scene with the flower bed. You know, again, it's all personality. And this is on the PlayStation 1 with pre-rendered backgrounds. And I hate to say it, by today's standards, ugly character models. They're blocky, nobody has hands. Everybody has buster arms, like Mega Man, pretty much. And they're all blocky, and everybody has, you know, shoulder pads and everything else. But it was great, and it was fun, and it was cutting edge. And then you got to these beautiful, amazing cutscenes. Uh, my personal favorite as a kid, I actually saved just before it, was the escape sequence when Cloud literally drives the motorcycle right through a window and everybody escapes in the, in the, the three-wheel pickup truck going down the highway listening to some excellent, I guess you could say, like, midi bass techno from Uematsu. I forgot the name of the song, but um, under the, uh, I think it's the Derelict or the Dirty Pizza. That, that's the song that plays in, um, shit, what's the name of the area? I forgot the name of the area, but... It, I love that song. And it's one of those things where it's in the playground area, I think, is where I, re I remembered it, hearing it the first time. But it was all like this cool stuff. There was nothing, I guess you could even say, inherently wrong with the game. It was, it was a B-52 after B-52 in terms of entertainment, music, battle system, graphics, plot, story, development. Everything about it was so good. And even then... I was so obsessed with this game. I pre, not pre-ordered. I imported the soundtrack. Four discs from Japan. It was like $100. I didn't even have the balls to tell my mom it was a soundtrack. <laughs> I think I told her it was a game. And she's like, oh, these games are getting expensive. And then she's like, wait a minute. Why is there only music playing? It was that good. I loved it, man. It was amazing. So when they talk about doing a remake... Of Final Fantasy VII, the first thing that came into my mind was A, I was excited. Two, I was afraid. And three, I wanted to know who was directing it. <laughs> because I was thinking, especially after playing Kingdom Hearts 3, I was like, if this is Kingdom Hearts 3 all over again, I'm gonna shit the bed. Like this this it this cannot happen. If you like Kingdom Hearts 3, more power to you. At the end I was really underwhelmed. Just being honest. And then there was this whole tumultuous uh, development cycle with Final Fantasy VII, and I got worried. Not because I didn't think the game was going to be good. It was the fan base I was worried about. Um, Final Fantasy VII fans are very particular, and uh, they're much like Kingdom Hearts fans. You'll never please them, as far as I'm concerned. You know, even you know Persona fans at this point. I think you'll you'll never fully please them. Meanwhile, I'm just happy this shit comes out, I guess you could say. But once I started to see, not even reviews, because I really kept myself in the dark, but once I began to see the direction they were taking leading up to it, I was like, okay, I can get behind this. They're going, they're focusing more on the story. Of course, it's going to be cinematic because it's Square Enix. Of course, there's going to be cutscenes out the wazoo. It's Square Enix. Of course, there's going to be a second Blu-ray of nothing but data because it's Square Enix. This excited me. I was like, okay, so let's see what they do with this. Like, you know, at this point, they're saying it's a remake. It's not a remaster. It's a remake. It is a reimagining, which means that they will be taking a similar idea. They will be taking similar characters, if not the same characters, and putting their own personal spin on the game. And then they did the uh, one thing that really disappointed me. Uh, this will be in installments. Which is kind of fitting if you think about it. If there's three parts, then technically, okay, it's one per disc. But then they said five, so I'm like, great, here we go. One of them is going to be the main story. Then we're going to get a spin-off thing that's going to be like two and a half hours. Then we'll get some DLC. And then we'll get the formal part two. It's going to be like Star Wars. 
That, that that's what I'm afraid of at this point. But stepping back into this game, this first part of this remake quintology, I guess is what it is. I got super hyped for it. And it was partially hype because of memory. Because as a kid, I was super hyped for this game to come out. I wanted to know what was going to happen to Cloud and Gang back then. Now I wanted to see what are they going to do with Cloud and the Gang. And I was greeted by... Truthfully, I think I prefer this to the original at this point. And that's really because this game took the original game environmentally had tons of character, I think. This game took that and made it breathing, made it livable. You know, the sequence where you're in Midgard and you're in the slums and, you, you know, you're running around, um, uh, running around, I guess, fuck, what was the name of that ghetto? I can't remember. Damn it. So happens when you play too many games. But... There were side quests, and some of them were, eh, you know, whatever. Like, the ones at the gym cracked me up. I thought that was great. I love the fact that they had different remixes of the battle theme and everything. That is fun. You know, that is acknowledging where they came from and putting their own spin on it. But most importantly, the environments now had a story behind them. They had living, breathing characters and individual arcs within them. And to me, that was amazing. That was great. Aerith's house looks beautiful. They, the, the cathedral scene, I nearly got choked up with tears. Like, there were certain parts where, mind you, I grew up with this game. My girlfriend has no context. She just knows Final Fantasy VII from me talking about it and complaining about it. And I'd look at her and go, oh my god, they kept it in, they kept it in, they kept it in. She's like, what the, like, she doesn't know. They kept in so much stuff, and it was all the stuff I would have wanted to keep in. The flashbacks, uh, certain scenes with Tifa. I love what they did with Tifa. You know, Tifa was actually my video game crush back when I was a kid. I, and I, I told my girlfriend that. I said, you know, Tifa used to be my video game crush back when I was a kid. And she's like, oh, really? And then I showed her a picture of what Tifa looked like back then. And she goes, oh, I wonder why. And then I showed her what she actually looked like in game. And she's like, oh, she's not half as pretty as, as you would think. <laughs> but they developed her so well and you know they gave Cloud a voice in this game some people I know were like oh I don't think he should really talk he needed to and I think that was the smart move you know he's not that emo brooding schmuck from Advent Children I'm sorry I love the movie but I hated him in it you know they made him much more of he's still brooding but he's quiet, he's reserved, he's not, he has attachment issues. He's afraid to get close to anybody. He doesn't want to. And then once he meets Aerith, you know, in the original game, Aerith breaks down his walls. And in this game, she again breaks down his walls. But this time you get to see Disney-esque romance. You know, she, the, you know, the flirting back and forth. You know, you got some personality to it. And, you know, as a kid back in the day, storytelling in video games has really come a long way. Localization isn't just straight up, okay, da 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 da, edit this out. Now there's personality and, col and character and color to it. You know, people who are rewriting the scripts are not doing a straight localization, uh, a straight translation. They are localizing it, period. It's not localization in the sense of this is, you know, if A, then B. Now it's, all right. We have to translate A to B, but let's throw in some adjectives and some, and some story and some other elements in there to make it living and breathing. And that's what this game does exceptionally well. And it made me so happy. I was thrilled at all of this. I couldn't get over it. I was like, my God, this was worth the 12 years or whatever the hell it was. It, I didn't want it to end. I honestly didn't want it to end. And it, it's sad because I know the story. So once it reached a certain point where you're in the tower, I knew, I'm like, there isn't that much time left. This journey is about to end. It was so much fun. So much fun. And Barrett, I actually, I couldn't stand Barrett in the original, you know? And he's probably one of the most developed characters in the original. And in this one, 
admittedly, they kind of made him like Terry Crews, which I love Terry Crews. But, you know, they gave him like that kind of bravado personality. But when you see him with, uh, with his daughter, and then you see like his heart and his passion for Avalanche and trying to save the planet, you really believe him. He, he's really charismatic. Again. That's hard to do. Now, mind you, I played this in English because to me, I was like, you know, I could have gone either way, but considering when I first watched Advent Children, I watched it in English, so I thought, let me just keep it that way. Which, by the way, they originally wanted to use the Advent Children character models for this game, in case you didn't know. Thank God they didn't. Thank God they did a total redesign. It was the smartest thing they could have done, because 2006... Uh, 2006 CG models versus 2020 is a little jank. A little jank and not the good jank. But once we got to the end part within the tower itself, and I knew this was coming to an end, I started to get a little upset because I'm like, okay, you know, this, this is it. This fun and exciting journey of disc one is coming to an end. And somehow they pushed it over 20 hours when it was originally four. And that's because they gave life and character to Midgar. Something they really didn't do in the original, or at least they did it in a different way. They did it through the pre-renders and everything else and setting a stage. Here you were actually able to live within the stage. And I think that absolutely fabulous. But once we're climbing up the tower, that's where you start to see differences. Or you see some differences beforehand which again, you know, even though I may spoil some things, I do want to keep it as vague as possible. But once I was in the tower, I was like, okay, I was like, this is starting to deviate a bit. Like, this is really starting to deviate a bit. What the hell's going on here? And then it hit me, once you get to the end part, just before the chase, this is where the remake starts to be a remake. It was already hinting at it. It was giving you some premonitions that there's going to be some slight changes here. And then you go into the final sequence of events after the chase. And I finally understood why they were going to call this a remake. Now, admittedly, it's a little Kingdom Heartsy, and I was getting kind of agitated at it just because I was like, please don't fuck it up. Please don't fuck it up. You did so well up until now. And now I totally understand why they hesitate to call it a remaster or Final Fantasy uh, 7 2020, this is a remake. And they do it in a clever way, I will say. Basically, they are inviting game players to truthfully decide which version of the story they want. And some people, I've, you know, some people at the end go, that ending. One of my friends said he absolutely hated it. He couldn't believe that they actually would do something like this and potentially alter gaming history. And I said, well, not really, because they're kind of get leaving the ball in your court for which version you want to roll with. But this is a spoiler, so if you're not interested, click off. Crisis Core is a lot more important now, and I have not played Crisis Core, so I got to get on that. <laughs> So, but I guess got to say, like, you know, this game, I felt so nostalgic playing it. And it was a nostalgia that I had not felt since probably Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I have not played Final Fantasy VII straight through since it came out back in 97, 98, whatever the heck it is, 96, something like that. And playing through it this time, this version of it, it was like a movie. It was like a 80s buddy cop movie in certain parts, you know? And then you get to see Wedge and Biggs, and you you like them. They're not just the toe, oh, look, there's Wedge and Biggs. They're in every single Final Fantasy. Hey, look, there's Sid. He's in every single Final Fantasy. Hey, Chocobo, they're in every single Final Fantasy. They had a key role. Jesse had a key role. Also, Jesse was a girl. As a kid, I thought Jesse was a dude. Figure that one out. I couldn't really tell with all those blocks, but... Everything about it, they expanded it. And it makes me wonder if this was all left on the cutting room floor. Or if this was totally rewritten. I really don't know. But one of the things they did say 
uh, in one of the development diaries I read up on, I think this was actually a really smart thing. They were like, we realized we had to make this soon because we wanted to have the original development team with us to help. And I think from a creative standpoint, that's very mature. As opposed to just taking a fresh idea and running with it and, you know, putting your own spin on it. You know, not not saying they had to get permission, but just being like, we need some guidance from the team that made this the legacy that it is. And I, I, I think that's great. And this is honestly, I think, is probably, as of this recording at least, which is in June, uh, one of my favorite games of 2020. I don't think I had a boring moment in it. And as somebody who typically what I call play for credits, I did what I thought was every side quest. Apparently I missed one, but I, uh, I enjoyed them. I just wanted to experience more of it. And then the way it ends, it ends on a cliffhanger, of course. And it says the unknown journey, I think it is, will continue. And at this point, it is unknown. Because this is where the remake becomes a remake. This is where the deviation truly starts. They are taking the original players who may have played this game back in the day or in their youth or what have you, or maybe two weeks before, and saying, here's some old, here's some new, let's go someplace different. And if you're a new game player and you've never played the original before, there may be certain parts where you're like, oh, wow, this is cool, but it won't be as impactful as it would be for somebody like myself. But I think you'll still get a good ride out of it. And I can't wait for the second part, truthfully. And then they said the words I didn't hope they would say, yeah, we're still in planning. I'm like, you motherfuckers. <laughs> truthfully, the game was, I don't think they could have done a better job, truthfully. The, the only thing I really would say needs some help potentially would be the battle system because i mean the ai is good and you know it's supposed to be dynamic and you know you're supposed to be able to feel high octane action i didn't really get that i kind of just wanted to go through the fight so i could see the next bit of story development because i was enjoying it that much but this game I, man it's so much fun oh and the and the brothel scene oh my god I'm sorry, the cross-dressing scene? Oh, I laughed. That made me so happy. I, I bet, First, the fact that they kept it in. And second, that they had fun with it. And even then, Cloud lets out this really good one-liner during that whole thing. Where they see him in the dress and everybody's kind of paused for a minute. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I know. Nailed it. Like... So self-aware, so in today's age. I don't know if you watch the show Nailed It. My girlfriend loves it. But every time I hear Nailed It, I just start laughing because that's the first thing that pops in my head. And the fact that he said it, I just burst out laughing. That They did a real... I'm gushing, obviously. It, is this necessarily the best RPG I've ever played? No, but I gotta say, all my expectations were shattered. They couldn't have done a better job. And uh, I do think it was smart to give enough familiar and then take it somewhere new now will that new be the version of the story that i want to say is quote unquote canon i don't know i won't know for probably another 10 years anyway final fantasy 7 remake wow what a game i've been alex and i'll see y'all in the next one take care <laughs>